Good evening. My name is Chief Insolvency and Companies Court Judge Briggs. I'm the head of the Insolvency and Companies Court that is part of the High Court in the Chancery Division. Uh, we're based in uh, the Rolls Building, and the Insolvency and Company Court is the only specialist uh, court in the UK which deals purely with insol insolvency and company law. Uh, uh, and we spend 100% of our time dealing with that area. I'm one of only three uh, courts or such courts in the world. Um, which So we're, we're similar to the bankruptcy judges in so southern New York. Um, and I have the pleasure this evening of introducing uh, what I think will be a really useful talk for you uh, with three excellent speakers. First to my right, or perhaps to your left if you're looking at me, is Emily Selderson. Uh, she's a commercial litig litigator with experience of commercial fraud and insolvency. Uh, she's ranked in latest chambers and partners in commercial dispute resolutions. And she said to have, ha have a uh, razor sharp mind and a prestigious <laughs> work ethic, which I think sounds good. And <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, uh, she, she's also said to be a pleasure to work with. So I'm glad that she sat next to you tonight, as well as being brilliant. Uh, also, I have um, uh, Jeremy uh, Richard, Richmond QC. Uh, Jeremy's practice is, is quite wide. He is a commercial and chancery uh, specialist and uh, he has a wide experience of insolvency law. Uh, he was admitted to the New York Bar in 1996 and has worked as a New York lawyer in a blue chip firm in Manhattan and then uh, the city. Um, he is uh, said to be extremely commercial with great tenacity uh, and uh, I can, I can uh, vouch for that myself. Um, he was said to be a very impressive junior silk. Uh, and then lastly, Nicola Alsop, uh, she is, uh, again, has a strong international uh, element to her practice, was called to the bar in the BVI in 2012, and then the Cayman Islands in 2016. Uh, she is said to be fantastic with clients, so lucky you, with an excellent manner, and uh, very pleasant and approachable. Uh, she is also easy to instruct and decisive, something which I think is very important for counsel. So this evening's talk um, will take us on a cross-border uh, journey. The first stop is the EU. We will alight there and uh, the, the train uh, uh, on the train to remind ourselves of what it was to be in the EU, EU signed up as a user friendly regulation that has the centre of main interest and establishment as a fundamental concept. Uh, a regulation that gives some certainty to proceedings in the pan European theatre uh, and it provides for the applicable law and effects of recognition under Article 7 and 20. The next stop takes us to a new world where we will discover some of the effects of leaving the European Union. Although Parliament has retained part of the EU regulations, Article 7 and 20, which I just mentioned, are uh, uh, omitted. So the legal landscape has, has changed considerably. The third stop on our journey will consider the alternatives and we will hear about both the mechanics of making an application under the model law and some of the court-based rules that practitioners must have regard to. Uh, we will be reminded that the model law is procedural in effect only. At this staging post, we will hear about the rule in Gibbs on one of my most favorite cases, Pan Ocean. The last stop concerns uh, other jurisdictional gateways, namely the Common Law and the Insolvency Act 1986 where to use a phrase uh, commonly used, this jurisdiction which is linked with the cricket playing countries. So with that as an introduction, I would like to hang, hold a, um, a hand over to Nicola. Oh, um, Emily's going to keep Oh, up. Emily, <laughs> I beg your pardon. No, that's I'll okay. hand over to Emily. <laughs> Thank you very much for that very warm introduction. Um, so I'm going to set the scene. I will explain the problem that's arisen with cross-border issues because of Brexit. And then Jeremy and Nicola will talk you through some potential prob uh, problems, potential solutions to the problems that we've got now because of Brexit. So let me just give you an overview of where I'm going with this talk. I'm going to talk you through the EU regulation, uh, insolvency regulation, and how it worked before Brexit. Um, I'll talk to you about the effect of Brexit on that EU insolvency regulation and why, why this has raised sorts of, all sorts of problems, why this matters. And then before I hand over to Jeremy, I will just mention uh, the state of play in respect of insolvency proceedings that were opened before we left the EU, so before 11pm on the 31st of December. So to kick, to kick off, 
what are we talking about here? We are talking about this regulation. It's the EU insolvency proceedings recast insolvency regulation. It's a, a recast regulation. The original regulation was replaced in 2015. And the EU regulation applies still to all EU, EU member states except Denmark for insolvencies that started on or after the 26th of June 2017. Now, the EU insolvency regulation governs enforcement and recognition of insolvencies between EU member states. And in the, e in the UK, it applied to liquidation, administration, voluntary arrangements under insolvency legislation and bankruptcy. So it covered all the big in types of insolvency. And it was very important because the judgments regulation, which everyone is probably more familiar with, the recast Brussels regulation, the regulation that applied to enforcement um, and jurisdiction uh, in respect of judgments in civil and commercial matters, expressly excluded insolvency proceedings. So if you had an insolvency, cross-border insolvency issue in the EU, you had to go to the EU insolvency regulation. The Lugano Convention, similar to the Judgments Regulation, doesn't cover most types of insolvency. It does cover schemes of arrangement, but liquidations and administrations aren't covered. Similarly, the Hague Convention on Choice of Courts doesn't cover the main types of insolvency. So you really did have to use the EU regulation. On top of that, domestic UK law provided that where the EU regulation applied, you had to use the EU regulation. That was the way that you went. Now, the regulation introduced this concept of the centre of main interests into UK law, and it provided that if the centre of main interests of a debtor was in a member state, insolvency proceedings opened in that member state were the main proceedings throughout Europe, and they were recognised automatically as such throughout Europe. You could open up secondary proceedings in a different member state. Uh, if the debtor had an establishment in that member state. So central main interests and establishment, as Judge Briggs said, were the key concepts under the EU regulation. And where secondary proceedings were opened, uh, those generally just governed the debtor's assets in that particular member state. But one of the key attractions or key benefits with the EU regulation was that it set out a unified approach to the law and the rules and the procedure. So as soon as you were within it, you were set on a path in terms of getting recognition and reciprocal arrangements between courts in different member states. And Article 7 of the EU regulation addressed applicable law. It was one of the key provisions. Article 7.1 provided that, save as otherwise provided in this regulation, the law applicable to insolvency proceedings and their effects shall be that of the member state within the territory in which proceedings are open. So the law applicable to insolvency proceedings and the effect of that law of the member state is the, was the law of the member state where the proceedings had been opened. That was it. So you were applying different law if you had, if, if main proceedings had been opened in one state, the law of that state applied even in other states of the um, European Union. And Article 7.2 set out some specific matters that were covered by the law um, of the relevant member state. And they included important things like when set off could be invoked and the effect of insolvency proceedings on contracts to which the debtor was a party, and the effects of insolvency proceedings on proceedings brought by individual creditors. So it really was a unified approach um, to cross-border insolvency in the EU. And this Article 7 actually displaced the ruling Gibbs that Judge Briggs mentioned, and Jeremy is going to talk to you a little bit about the ruling Gibbs. It's a Court of Appeal case from the 1890s, which we now all need to be more familiar with than we were before, because um, the EU regulation no longer provides reciprocity. So there are perhaps three key other articles in the EU regulation. And there was Article 19, which said that any judgment um, opening insolvency proceedings in the court of the member state was recognised in all other member states from the moment it became effective. So that's automatic recognition. Article 20 set out the effect of that recognition. The effect is that the um, opening of proceedings in that member state has the same consequences in all other member states with any other, without any other formalities. So those two articles deal with recognition of judgments across borders. Article 21 deals with enforcement and essentially says that the office holder that's appointed by the court in one member state can exercise all his or her powers in any other member states, and that includes, subject to some important conditions, recovering assets in other member states. 
So it really did set out this unified approach. And the idea was that it, it was easy for the office holder to manage an insolvency where there were creditors and assets in different parts, different member states, to do that cost effectively and to maximize returns for creditors. So what has happened to the, to the EU regulation in the UK as a result of Brexit? Well, I'm sure as we all know, the U European Communities Act was repealed as of 11 o'clock on the 31st of December last year. But Section 3 of the European Union Withdrawal Act meant that directly affected EU legislation was incorporated into English law at that, at that stage. You may think, wonderful, we get the EU regulation. Unfortunately, that is not the case because the snappily titled Insolvency Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2019 take a scythe to what is retained in UK law from the EU Insolvency Regulation and effectively denude it of anything useful in terms of cross-border recognition and enforcement. And it, it means that you don't get the, the whole EU regulation package anymore. So let's have a look at those amendments in a bit more detail. The first thing to note is that under Article 1 of the retained EU regulation, the regulation is just one way in which you can open insolvency proceedings in this jurisdiction. It's not the primary way if the, if the regulation applies. So it's just one of several other ways. Interestingly, the new Article A1 retains these ideas of the centre of main interests of a debtor and establishment. So you can still open insolvency proceedings in the UK if you can show that a debtor's centre of main interest is in the UK. And the, I'll, I'll come on to this, but the assumption is for a foreign company, it's where the registered office is. It's a rebuttable presumption, but you may have to work quite hard to, to establish that. And um, the Comey is in this country if it's a foreign company. You may have more luck with an established, showing that um, the, the debtor has got an establishment in this jurisdiction. But even if you are able to open insolvency proceedings on that basis, it doesn't really help you because as Judge Briggs has said, all those useful articles have now gone. There is no automatic recognition, no reciprocal uh, arrangements between the UK and EU member states anymore. So what about these retained concepts of Comey and establishment? Given that we are now divorced from the, from the EU, how are we going to deal with interpretation of those two um, concepts? Well, for that, you have to look at the EU Withdrawal Act. Section six sets out the approach that the courts will take. Firstly, the courts aren't bound by principles or judgments of the European court after 11 o'clock on the 31st of December last year. So for all intents and purposes, EU law is frozen as it applies and EU decisions are frozen as the law applied it at the end of last year. Um, you can look at retained, um, retained case law and principles though, but the Supreme Court isn't bound by any retained EU case law, so the Supreme Court can still change the law. There is some useful guidance in this case, it's a Court of Appeal case from March this year, Lipton and BA City Flyer. And the Court of Appeal um, looked at the way that the, the correct approach by courts to the interpretation of retained EU law. And the key paragraph you really want to look at in that judgment is paragraph 83, which is a very helpful summary of, of what the courts decided about this. And they run through section six of the Withdrawal Act and also say that a purposive approach to interpretation is, is the correct way to go. So you look at the entire EU regulation as it's been retained and what, what it was trying to achieve. So in terms of opening proceedings in the UK, the reason I got onto this was how are we going to deal with Comey and establishment? Well, we still have the definition of um, the centre of main interest that is in the retained EU uh, insolvency regulation. It's defined as a place where the debtor conducts the administration of its interests on a regular basis. And very importantly, it has to be ascertainable by third parties. And as I said, the presumption is it's where the, for a company, it's where the registered office is, but that's a rebuttable presumption. So you can still, if you can persuade a court that the central main interest is in this country, despite it being a foreign company, the EU reg as retained does give, give you um, the option to open proceedings here. Establishment um, is also still defined in the retained EU regulation. Essentially, you're looking for a non-transitory economic activity with human means and assets. So something that's actually got people involved, some kind of business in this country, and it has to have been here operating for, for at least three months. There are, don't forget other ways to, to wind up or, or open insolvency proceedings against foreign companies in this jurisdiction. For example, section 221 of the Insolvency Act, 
which allows the court um, or gives the court the power to wind up unregistered companies and is used often to, to wind up foreign companies. The main problem, as I've alluded to, with Brexit and the EU regulation is that we no longer have this lovely uh, automatic system, this set of rules and procedures, and the consequences that follow from recognition across borders in the, um, the EU, between the EU and the UK in respect of insolvency. So two obvious questions arise. The first is how do you get EU insolvency recognized or enforced here? How do you get assistance from the UK court if you're dealing with a foreign insolvency? And these are the, the options that Nicola and Jeremy are going to talk to you about. The second question is how do you get English insolvency proceedings recognized in the EU courts? Or how do you get assistance from EU courts if, if you're dealing with a, a UK insolvency and the debt has got assets in other jurisdictions? And that's outbound recognition. Nicola's going to mention it briefly, but essentially it looks like you're going to have to get foreign law advice on that. Uh, there is some useful guidance um, that the government has published. Now, before I hand over to Jeremy, I'll just briefly mention in-flight proceedings. Now, in-flight proceedings means those insolvency proceedings that were opened before 11 p.m. on the 31st of December last year. And the punchline is that the EU regulation, as it was, before the, the good bits are retained and those apply to the in-flight proceedings. It's a bit of a torturous journey to get to that point, but I've set it out very briefly on this slide. So Article 4.2 of those snappily titled regulations says that the amendments don't apply to proceedings with Article 67.3c of the withdrawal agreement. You have a look at that article. And it says that um, the insolvency regulation applies to proceedings under Article 6, one of the regulation, as long as they were opened, the main proceedings were opened before the end of the transition period. Article 6, one of the regulations says the courts of the member state where proceedings were opened have jurisdiction for any action um, deriving directly from and closely linked with them. So if you um, are dealing with a UK, EU cross-border insolvency situation, it's going to be worth checking when the main proceedings were opened uh, before you dash off and, and try and think about different ways in which you might have to overcome this problem of recognition because the answer is the original EU insolvency regulation may well apply or probably does apply. So I'm going to hand over to Jeremy now who will talk about one possible solution to this problem. Thanks Emily, thank you very much. And thank you very much Judge for your kind words of introduction. <clears throat> I'm going to deal today with the cross-border insolvency regulation um, 2006 which I will call SIBA um, for hopefully obvious reasons. Um, the paradigmatic example um, which I'm going to deal with is a situation where you have, say, for example, a German administrator or liquidator who wants to have his or her insolvency recognised and have effect um, in, in um, Great Britain, um, but obviously for people to just talk in England and Wales. Um, there's some good news, um, which is that the um, SIBA is procedural, so it's relatively straightforward and um, relatively comprehensible um, codes. Um, or procedures by which a, um, a foreign insolvency can be um, recognised. Um, the bad news, however, is that unlike the, um, the EU insolvency reg, um, it doesn't have bright line rules, as Emily mentioned, like the allocation of jurisdiction um, to insolvency proceedings, depending on the insolvent company's COMI. It has no choice of law rules and no express provisions and I use that word express advisedly for reasons that will become clear, express provisions and enforcement of recognition of judgments um, regarding um, EU insolvency um, proceedings. So um, unlike the um, EU insolvency reg, um, it, there's no automatic recognition. So if you have to take the paradigmatic example of a German insolvency, um, you have to do something under SIBA to have it, um, to give it recognition in England. It's not an automatic procedure. And that procedure is set out um, relatively clearly in Article 15 of the Cross-Border Insolvency Reg. Um, but an important point to note is that if you're an outbound, um, if you're an English administrator who wants to have um, his or her um, insolvency recognized in another country, then there's no need for reciprocity. So for instance, um, you don't have to show that the country you're going to um, has, um, has, has signed up with some reciprocal treaty with Britain. Um, unfortunately, for the purposes of the EU member states, only four countries have adopted UNCITRA, which is the UN treaty on which um, SIBA is based. And those four countries are Greece, Poland, Romania, and Slovenia. So if you're an English liquidator, I'm um, looking for, say, um, recognition in um, Germany, 
um, you can't um, generally, uh, we can't apply in SIBA because that's not been adopted or the anti-trial rule has not been adopted in, in Germany. And Nicola will touch upon that a little briefly in, in her talk. Um, so that's the sort of mixed picture. Um, as to the nuts and bolts of the recognition application um, itself, um, just a few uh, takeaway points. Um, the first is it uh, may be made without notice. Um, sometimes if you're say a, a shipper and you want your, um, your client's um, insolvency to be recognized in England, um, it might be better to do it on notice. Um, firstly, because it gives anyone who may be affected, say the counterparty in arbitration, the right to come along to court and look for some variation on the, on the recognition order you're looking for. And also it may be said, and I say may, reduce your um, duty um, of full and frank disclosure, which I'll come to in a second. Um, in order to get the recognition, it's a relatively straightforward process. You have um, pro forma forms from uh, the court, which you can tick. But one has to pursue a little bit of caution because um, it's very easy to tick boxes and then not quite think whether or not you correctly tick the box. So I just want to pick a couple of my experience, which can trip people up. Um, in order to get recognized in England, you have to show that your insolvency is a proceeding. So in most cases, say, for instance, taking my example of the German insolvency, that should be relatively clear. But the definition of proceeding is actually set out in the reg, and it has to be a collective judicial administrative proceeding in a foreign state, including an interim proceeding, pursuant to a law relating to insolvency, in which the proceed in which proceeding the assets and the affairs of the debtor are subject to the control or supervision by a foreign court for the purposes of a reorganization or liquidation. A bit of a mouthful, but I would advise when you're going for recognition to take local counsel advice to make sure you hit the recognition on um, that definition. In most cases, say a chapter 15 in America is obviously clear. Um, as I say, most EU insolvency uh, regs are, are usually clear whether or not it's a proceeding, but sometimes it can be a gray area. So just to cover yourself, I would advise if you can, and time allows to get some local council advice to make sure you hit that definition. The other slightly odd quirk is that the application must be made by a foreign representative. Um, and that's defined as a personal body, including one appointed on an interim basis, authorized in a foreign proceeding to administer the reorganization or liquidation of the debtor's assets or affairs, or to act as the representative of the foreign proceeding. Again, a bit of a mouthful, but again, I would recommend you take local council advice because sometimes, say for instance, in the uh, recognition orders sought by the Thomas Cook Group Insolvency, um, some of the um, liquidators were actually corporate entities and it wasn't entirely clear whether or not they were technically foreign representatives. So it's something you should check before you tick the box certifying that the applicant is the foreign representative. Um, broadly speaking, once you hit those two criteria, so you're a foreign representative and it's proceeding, you are granted as of right recognition in England. And um, before I go on to what the effect of the recognition in England actually means, um, I just want to uh, make an, uh, a little note here about the duty of full and frank disclosure. Um, it's without doubt that if you make an application ex parte without notice to any party, you have a duty of full and frank disclosure to the court. And as in any application, um, uh, the duty of full and frank disclosure is um, uh, incumbent upon the applicant, it's also incumbent upon the solicitors. So it's very, very important that you um, step over, bend over backwards to make sure you comply with that. Paradigmatically, um, if you're looking to have your foreign insolvency recognized in England, for instance, for the purposes of looking for a stay of an LCIA or LMAA arbitration in England, it's very important you actually mention in the affidavit, or at least in your skeleton argument, which arbitrations are pending and which will be stayed. Uh, and uh, at the risk of um, being a gainsay by um, the chief um, ICC judge, um, that is something which a judge um, will expect to see and may be quite grumpy um, if he discovers when the counterpart of arbitration comes along looking to vary the order that um, he or she wasn't told about it. So that's just a word um, to the wise uh, and something. Uh, and I would actually recommend when you make an application, you have a section called the duty of full of rent disclosures. So you focus both your and the client's mind upon that very important duty. So once you get your, um, hopefully as a right recognition, um, what do you get? Um, well, the first um, automatic effect is to stay of any action against or execution in respects of assets of the debtor over which the English and Welsh courts have jurisdiction. And that, um, in simple terms, is the same sort of relief um, a company which has been wound up 
um, under Section 132 of the Insolvency Act, so uh, a compulsory winding up would enjoy. So it, it results in a state of proceedings. For shippers and aviators, um, it will often be the case that the insolvency will be some sort of reconstruction or restructuring process in the EU member states. So for instance, uh, in, German, in Germany, in shipping insolvencies often involving the restructuring of debt or the reordering of debt. In that case, um, the courts will be amenable um, to grant an extended order, um, which actually I think is often called the usual extended order, which gives the debtor company the same protection as a British company and administration um, would um, enjoy. And that's important because that will, um, if you get the usual extended order, um, stay at least temporarily the execution of a secured creditor over your client's debtor assets in England, unless that secured um, creditor gets permission of the court or the consent of your client, the foreign representative. So that's something to bear in mind if you're applying um, for a client in the EU who is in the process of restructuring under their insolvency procedure to consider whether you need to get the usual extended order. Um, because if you don't get it, then you um, have limited protection from an execution by secured creditors in this jurisdiction. Um, the tricky question, um, which has caused um, at least 10, 14 years of litigation since the CBR was passed into law in England, is what other relief the courts can grant. Um, Article 21 of SIBA has um, a wonderfully gnomic um, phrase saying the court can grant any other appropriate relief. But what does the appropriate relief mean? Um, it can include a number of uh, equally vague uh, uh, relief. I'll just go through the main ones. It can include the staying, the commencement or continuation of individual actions or individual proceedings concerning the debtor's assets, rights, and obligations to the extent they haven't been stayed under your Article 20 normal or default recognition. Um, it can also state execution against the debtor's assets to the extent not stated under Article 20. And here's a, a tricky one, uh, Article 21 1G, any additional relief that may be available to a British insolvency office holder under the law of GB. That's important to note that all of these provisions are examples of the general of the court to give appropriate relief. They don't um, in my view, limit what the court can do. So it still doesn't quite answer the question of what the limitations of appropriate relief the English court can give um, are. Um, one question which arose um, in most, most jurisdictions um, when the anti-trial law was adopted by them is the extent to which um, the judgments in the foreign, in, in the judgments in the foreign insolvency proceedings could be given effect um, in the uh, country where you're looking for recognition. Um, and different countries have come up with wildly different answers. On the one side, you have countries, um, jurisdictions like the United States, um, where um, if you go there and have your English um, insolvency recognized in the US, in some circumstances, the US bankruptcy judges will be prepared to give um, effect to an English judgment um, affecting the rights of creditors in the States. Um, the situation um, in England is very different, um, and that's very different because of the rule in Gibbs. Um, it's um, actually, in my opinion, not a rule, it's rules. Uh, and the main ones are, um, or the three of them are, a debt governed by English law is not discharged or compromised by foreign insolvency proceedings. So even if you um, get your uh, even if you get your foreign insolvency recognised in England, um, if the debt's governed by English law, um, it is unlikely um, that it will be discharged or compromised by a judgment in the foreign insolvency proceedings. Um, the second limb is not something I'm going to touch upon today. Uh, and in my experience, um, it's not something we often argued about, but I could be wrong about that. A debt under the insolvency law of a foreign country is only treated as a discharge in England and Wales, a discharge under the law applicable to the contract. Um, I am going to touch upon the third element of the rule, which is if a creditor submits to the foreign insolvency proceedings, the rule in, Glib, um, in Gibbs does not apply. And that's an important point uh, for reasons we'll come on to in a second. Um, a case which we're familiar with the shippers among you, um, Fibria Cellulose versus Pan Ocean uh, Company, and this is a case of Mr. Justice uh, uh, Wilson uh, about six years ago. And, and the facts are relatively straightforward. 
There was a long-term charter party, choice of law, England and Wales, and Pan Ocean's Comey was Korea. So its main insolvency was I'm in Korea under, I think, chapter, the equivalent of their chapter 15 under the Korean uh, Debtor and Bankruptcy Rehabilitation Act. Um, the um, CP contained the termination uh, uh, on notice clause um, or ipso facto clause upon the insolvency of the counterparty. An ipso facto clause, as you know, is a clause that says in the event of insolvency, the contract either can be terminated or is in fact terminated. Pan Ocean enters into insolvency business in Korea, subsequently recognized in England under SIBA. The ipso facto clause is generally enforceable in England. Um, there's no public policy reason in England why under um, that kind of clause is not given effect, but is unenforceable in Korea uh, and a number of other major jurisdictions as well, um, such as the United States. The foreign representative sought to argue that under SIBA Article 21 1A and G, Korean law should apply, so Fibria could not serve a notice of termination under the CP and sought to restrain service of the notice. So what the foreign representative is saying is that um, he wanted to, in this case, um, apply Korean law to keep alive a CP. And in commercial terms, that's quite a big deal because I think it was a, a CP for about seven years with at least half of its term to run. The decision of the judge um, was relatively uh, robust. Um, he said that Article 21.1a um, did not extend to the service of a notice of termination. So just when it's playing into construction, the appropriate relief didn't extend to, um, to, um, to serving a notice of termination because the matter of English law, um, just by way of background, that's a contractual uh, right which you, a contract counterparty may or may not um, use. Article 21.1g, uh, the judge said that relief is procedural in nature. It did not extend so as to affect substantive contractual rights. And even though there was a fine line between procedure and substantive law, here the application clearly sought to affect Fibria's um, substantive rights. In any event, the judge considered himself bound by the ruling Gibb. So the foreign insolvency recognized in England could not deprive Fibria of a substantive contractual right. So that essentially is uh, the, that. The judge uh, uh, refused the case or refused the application of the foreign representative on a number of grounds, some of them on the basis of construction of the CBR, and some of them on the basis of the ruling Gibbs. Another, um, some might say, ingenious attempt um, by uh, foreign representatives was in the case of Baki Shireva versus Schwer Bank of Russia. And uh, forgive me for anyone who, who's, um, who speaks some better, uh, I'm not sure that's uh, better Azerbaijani than I do, um, or have a better pronunciation. I'm sure you do, actually. Um, but the facts of this uh, are relatively um, straightforward. There are restructuring proceedings in Azerbaijan. The restructuring plan and to discharge all debt owed to the insolvent party in exchange for a new debt, irrespective of whether the creditor voted against or abstained from the plan. So essentially it was a form of a cram down. So all parties were caught whether or not you voted for it or not. The proceedings were recognized in England under the SIBA. And the foreign representative argued that under Article 21 A and B, so that's aspects of the appropriate relief that the courts may give, um, the court had the procedural power to grant a permanent stay against the claim of two creditors holding debt instruments governed by English law, but it would not, but had not participated in the restructuring plan. Now, the reason why it's important they had not um, participated in the restructuring plan is that they had submitted to the jurisdiction of the Azerbaijan scheme. The ruling Gibbs would have been disapplied because they would have submitted arguably to the jurisdiction of Azerbaijan. Um, the judge held that there was no material distinction between the exercise of a right to terminate per Pan Ocean and the general right of enforcement. There was no jurisdiction, therefore, under Article 21A or B to grant a permanent injunction. And even if there were a jurisdiction, it could not be exercised so as to contravene the ruling Gibbs. The judge left open the question of whether a moratorium, um, which is automatically, um, automatically imposed by reason of recognition could extend beyond the duration of the foreign proceedings. So the question there was at the foreign proceedings end, does the moratorium in England still exist and live on? Um, the Court of Appeal has done its judgment um, at the back end of 2018. Uh, it, it reaffirmed uh, Mr. Justice Hilliard's um, decision. Um, nothing in Article 21 suggests there was a procedural power to circumvent the ruling Gibbs. And once the foreign proceedings have ended, um, the foreign representative no longer held office, so a strong implication 
that there's no scope under SIBA for further orders or for early or for um, the earlier relief to be maintained in England. So, um, in short, um, the ruling Gibbs is um, a very powerful uh, uh, ruling indeed, as things stand, because unless your client um, submits to the foreign insolvency proceeding, even if the foreign representative comes here and gets recognition, his rights under English law will be um, maintained. Um, so um, some takeaways. Um, if you are um, a debtor who's being pursued by a foreign representative, it's very, very important to take local council advice to avoid submitting to the jurisdiction of the foreign insolvency proceedings, because if you do, you lose the benefits of um, uh, the ruling GIB. Um, the wider takeaways um, in terms of strategy are that um, post-Brexit, um, there's significantly less powers for an insolvency holder in the EU um, to uh, give effect to judgments and to um, get recognition of his insolvency and its effects in um, England and Wales. Um, for outbound recognitions, so you're an English insolvency petitioner looking to have your um, insolvency recognised or given effect to some extent in, in the EU, um, it's the SIBA or UNSA trials of limited use because it only covers or has only been accepted by four EU member states. Um, uh, so the vast majority of other member states and the main economies have just not um, uh, have not accepted onto trial and as very unlikely they will in the near future. Um, the future attempts to use SIBA to enforce substantive insolvency decisions or judgments in EU insolvency proceedings will probably fail in the absence of um, GB legislation. So Parliament's going to have to decide the rule and gives isn't a good law. Unless, as I say, your clients submit the jurisdiction in the EU insolvency proceedings, in which case there may be a risk your clients in England will be subject to an EU insolvency judgment. Um, just think something to watch, what I think it's a long way down the path, is there has been a working group which has published an UNSA-trial model law on insolvency-related judgments in July 2018, which if accepted by England would um, almost certainly overrule the ruling Gibbs. Um, but as my, the last research attempt I made a couple of days ago to find out what the status of that particular um, document is in English legislation is I don't think there's going to be much action on it anytime soon. So um, with those um, takeaways, I'm going to uh, pass over uh, to Nicola. Thank you very much. Yes, so I'm going to talk about section 426 of the Insolvency Act and common law recognition. So Emily has identified the problem and the gaps that have been left following Brexit. Jeremy has identified one solution, that's the CBIRs. Um, and I'm now going to identify potentially two other solutions, although as we'll see, unfortunately, they're not perfect. I've set out on the first slide there the wording of section 426. Um, I'm not going to read it out, we'll be pleased to hear, but it um, um, concerns a request for assistance from the UK court, and there are four conditions which must be met before the UK court can provide such assistance. The first is that the request for assistance must come from another qualifying court. Now, note that this differs quite significantly from the CBIR in the sense of there's no power into this provision to entertain a request made by a foreign office holder. Instead, it's a request made by um, the foreign court and it must come from another part of the UK, the Channel Islands, the Isle of Man or a designated country or territory. That's the second requirement. Now, as our judges noted, the cricket playing countries um, can make requests under this provision. So the co former Commonwealth countries and Commonwealth countries. Um, and also important to note post-Brexit that 426 applies to insolvency proceedings in the Republic of Ireland and Gibraltar. The third request, the third requirement, sorry, is that the requesting court must have jurisdiction in relation to insolvency law. So it's an insolvency court, a foreign insolvency court. And finally, the request must relate to insolvency law. Now, despite the wording in the section there that the UK court shall assist, the court retains a discretion as to whether or not to provide assistance. And as we can see from subsection five there, that in cooperating with the court, the UK court can apply the insolvency law of the UK or the insolvency law of the foreign country requesting assistance. Um, that's 
interesting because it means that the English court can make an order that is not available under the law of the requesting court. And as we'll see in a moment, that makes this provision to some extent wider than the recognition that's available at common law. Now, section 426 is not concerned with blanket recognition, but it does work rather well in the case of an ad hoc request for assistance. Um, it's flexible and it can adopt, uh, adapt to the specific circumstances and assistance can be tailored accordingly. And I've set out some examples there of the type of assistance that can be provided under section 426. And they're just examples. So an order for an injunction, a declaration recognising the rights of a foreign insolvency representative, and also the making of an administration order. However, section 426 comes with its limits. Um, it doesn't apply to a country that's not specifically designated. And so Switzerland is not a designated country under section 426, and therefore relief under 426 is not directly available whether um, under the provisional by analogy. Further, the court itself cannot extend the list of designated countries for the purpose of section 46, and that's Mrs. Justice Proudman's judgment in Reed Phoenix. And finally, and quite significantly, it cannot be used to enforce a foreign judgment where that foreign judgment wouldn't otherwise be recognised as a matter of common law. And that comes from the Supreme Court decision in NECAP, which I'm going to deal with in a moment. So that's my whistle stop summary of section 46. And I'm now going to move on to common law recognition. And in this context, I'm going to start with some principles. And these principles are not just a philosophical importance, but they help to inform us as lawyers of the approach that the English court is likely to adopt. And there are three key principles in this regard. The first is universalism. Um, and that's the principle that insolvency proceedings in relation to a debtor should apply worldwide. So that there is only one primary insolvency proceeding in which all of the creditors worldwide are entitled to proof. This makes sense. Unfortunately, however, as um, Lord Hoffman and others have commented, however much we may aspire to it, full universalism is probably only realistically going to be achieved through international treaty. There is no such international treaty, and therefore the English court applies something which is known as modified universalism in relation to insolvency proceedings. And that principle, as the name suggests, qualifies universalism by allowing the local courts the discretion. Um, and the local court evaluates the fairness of the home country procedures. It looks at protecting the interests of local creditors and it scrutinizes in an individual case whether or not it's appropriate to defer to main insolvency proceedings. But whether it's universalism that's being adopted or modified universalism, the, the key that follows from this is the principle of assistance. And that's, and that means that the English court will take active steps to provide assistance to a foreign insolvency um, officer with a view to um, within the realms of modified universalism. Now, um, the pursuant to its common law principles, the English court will um, generally recognize the winding up or dissolution of a company carried out under the laws of its country of incorporation. And so that's an important starting point, working out where the, the company has been incorporated. Um, and it will remit assets, realizations made in subordinate insolvency proceedings in England and Wales to the foreign liquidator. But there's an important caveat there. That, that caveat is where the foreign liquidation is going to proceed and distribute such assets to creditors on a pari passu basis. And that really reflects this principle of modified universalism, that if the foreign liquidation would proceed and respect key principles of English liquidation, such as pari passu, then we're going to recognize it and assist. It's been said that the high watermark of universalism is found in decisions such as Cambridge Gas and re-HIH insurance, Privy Council and House of Laws decision respectively. But I'm not going to address those decisions in this talk because we've got insufficient time. And also the reasoning in those decisions has been criticized and doubted in subsequent cases, um, in particular in Rubin, Newcap and Singularis. So I'm going to focus instead um, on those decisions, the co-joined appeals in Rubin and Newcap and then Singularis. 
Now, before I turn to Rubin, it's important to put it in context to understand a bit more about the Dicey Rule. It's also referred to in the authorities as the Dicey and Morris Rule 43. Now, this concerns when, as a matter of common law, a foreign in personam judgment will be recognised by the English court. So it's not insolvency specific at all. It's a cardinal principle of English recognition of in personam judgments. And the English court will recognise such judgments in the four circumstances listed in the slide there. And the question the courts have had to grapple with is the extent to which those principles apply to a judgment given in insolvency proceedings. And that was the question that the court faced in Rubin. And the facts of Rubin were as follows. The bankruptcy court in the US in the course of chapter 11 proceedings had granted relief by way of summary judgment and default judgment. And that's important type of judgment that's granted for reasons we'll come into in a moment. Um, against officers and promoters of a company. And that company was in insolvency chapter 11 proceedings in the US. The receivers of the company applied for recognition of the US chapter 11 proceedings under the CBIR. And they also applied for permission to enforce the judgment as if it were a judgment of the High Court. And the receivers argued that the judgments were based on avoidance provisions, and so they were insolvency judgments, and therefore the Dicey and Morris rule didn't apply. And though none of those four conditions on the slide there had to be um, fulfilled. And the Court of Appeal broadly agreed. Now, looking at NewCap, which was the other decision that went up to the Supreme Court with Rubin, the facts of that were judgment had been given by the Supreme Court of New South Wales in the course of the liquidation of an Australian insurer. Now, that judgment determined that certain transactions to which the insurer were party were unfair preferences. So again, a similar avoidance judgment made in the context of insolvency proceedings. And that judgment, an application was made to recognise it in England, and the Court of Appeal upheld the decision to recognise the judgment. However, in the Supreme Court, the majority allowed the appeal in Rubin and dismissed the appeal in Newcap. And, and significantly, the majority held, as is set out on the first bullet point there, that the Dicey rule applies to a judgment given in the context of an avoidance action in insolvency proceedings. So there is no third parallel um, set of rules for enforcing in persona judgments and insolvency proceedings. Now that meant that in Rubin, the judgment was set aside because the defendants had not appeared in the US proceedings. And you remember I said a moment ago that the judgments granted had been default and summary judgments. However, in NewCap, the um, judgment would be recognized and enforced because the defendants had submitted to the jurisdiction of the Australian courts. And they'd done that by filing proofs of debt and participating in creditors' meetings. So it's clear from those decisions that common law recognition of insolvency proceedings does not extend the court's inherent power, as encapsulated in the Dicey Rule, to enforce the judgment of foreign courts. The other key decision in this area of common law recognition is Singularis. And in Singularis, the issue is whether the Bermudan courts had power to apply statutory provisions requiring the production of information and documents to a liquidator, which applied to Bermudan liquidations but in that case, in support of a Cayman liquidation. And the Privy Council held that the principle of modified universalism was part of the Bermudan common law. And you might say, well, that's very interesting, Nicola. <laughs> Why am I interested in Bermudan common law? But the Privy Council also noted in this respect that Bermudan um, common law was identical to the common law of England and Wales. So the decision there is therefore relevant to us. And the, the Privy Council held that there was a common law power to assist a foreign insolvency court by ordering the production of information which was necessary to the administration of foreign winding up. But that power was subject to some significant restrictions, and in particular, it did not extend to provide a foreign liquidator with information that he could not obtain by order of his home court if the third party had been subject to the laws of that jurisdiction. And so you'll see there that this power is more narrow than that under section 426, which allows the court to apply English law or the law of the foreign insolvency proceedings. And I've listed the other important restrictions there on the slide. 
Uh, and Singularis is an example of commodified universalism. And then a more recent decision in this area, which provides an interesting illustration of common law recognition in practice and the extent of persistence pursued, um, pursuant to such recognition is re Bedzamov. Um, and the really key thing to note about Bedzamov is that it illustrates beautifully that at common law, it's not just the recognition which is important, but the consequences which flow from that recognition and the extent of the assistance that the English court is going to provide. Um, and in Bedsamov, the Russian trustee in bankruptcy applied for an order recognising her appointment. Um, and there wasn't a problem with recognising the appointment because the bankrupt had submitted to the bankruptcy proceedings in Russia. Um, and therefore, there was a jurisdictional basis to recognise the bankruptcy over here. So, so far, so good. Um, the court noted that it was open to the bankrupt to resist recognition on grounds of fraud, breach of natural justice and public policy. However, on the facts, they didn't apply in that case, and so there was no bar to recognition. However, what was the effect of that recognition? Well, the court held that it um, was able to treat the bankrupt's movable property in England as vested in the trustee, based on classic common law and well-established principles. Um, but the real issue in that case was whether or not the bankrupt's immovable property, and there were properties in London which clearly were valuable, were going to, the English court was going to allow them to be vested in the Russian trustee in bankruptcy or grant any further relief in relation to those. And that's really what the trustee wanted. Uh, and the judge went through um, several cases and years of law and held that there was no English case in which an order had been made at common law vesting immovable property located in England in a foreign trustee or ordering a bankrupt to transfer any such property to a foreign trustee. Um, and on that basis, he held that the foreign bankruptcy um, did not vest immovable property in England in the trustee. So two points to take away from that decision. Um, first, the issue of recognition may not be the important one or the significant one in the case. Um, it might rather be focused on the consequences which flow from such recognition. But secondly, to my mind, this case demonstrates the English court's reluctance, perhaps, to extend relief available as a consequence of common law recognition beyond that which is settled and has been recognised historically as a matter of case law. Um, the judge noted that there was no English case which granted this relief, and on that basis he wasn't prepared to grant such relief in that case. Now, I know Emily and Jeremy have both touched briefly on outgoing recognition, and um, you'll be pleased to hear that I don't have much to add. I'm sorry it's a bit of a cop out, but ultimately I'm afraid it is a question of local law, because one is looking at the laws of other EU states or countries abroad. Uh, there is some useful guidance, which I've included a link to on the slide there, and um, that's been produced by our government, and it's useful guidance as a starting point containing some basic information as to recognition in other EU member states. And then, as Jeremy said, important to remember that the Institral model law has been adopted by the four EU member states he mentioned, Poland, Slovenia, Romania and Greece, and so certainly in those states there should be an easier route to outgoing recognition. Um, thank you very much for listening. I'm not sure if we've got any questions, either from our in-person audience or Sarah is manning our, our video link. Well, Emily, I, I, I've got a question for you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I think uh, this it seems to be whether the EU regulations apply as they were or apply as the retained regulations is, is a temporal one. Yes. Um, and the temple, the, the, the timing is 11 o'clock on the 31st of December 2020. I, I, I think one of the challenges is to understand exactly when proceedings have been opened. That is a very difficult question. Um, Can you I, give I, us any, any guidance? <laughs> 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 I, I think mean, I mean there must be there's several possibilities. Um, so I suppose the first one is, is when a petition is, is presented. Yes. I suppose it would depend. You'd have to look. So the short answer is no, I can't give you any definitive guidance. Just speaking from 
um, first principles, you would have to look at for definitions of when proceedings have been opened. So that would obviously be easier for us in the UK, dealing with UK proceedings being opened. It might be when the petition has been presented, it might be when um, moves have been made or an administrator has been appointed, that sort of thing might be enough to open proceedings for the purposes of the EU regulation. But in terms of what has happened in other EU member, well, in, in EU member states, not the UK, yes. you're going to have to look, I think, at what the proceeding is and what the what the law is in the EU member states as to when a proceeding has been opened. It's going to be a very fact specific um, exercise you'll have to you'll have to undertake. Yes, I, I think there's there's two 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 things there. Perhaps when um, you say when one one is when the proceeding has been opened in the European state, and the other one has been opened here in the UK. Um, and, and my, I don't know, subject to anybody else on the panel um, wanting to, to give a view on it, I, sus I suspect it's probably when there's been a decision made by the court as opposed to anything else. So that could be an, an injury application where before an order is made, where the, a decision has been made, or it could be the final order. Um, but perhaps uh, that's something to, to come, I don't know. <laughs> It's quite heavily legislated in our insolvency act isn't there and so schedule b1 specifies when administration starts and so on and um there's obviously provisions dealing with compulsory liquidation so we should be able to look to our law to determine when our main proceedings were opened yes. um but obviously it's a completely different question but, uh, as to you know, you know administration have difficulties because it does it does it does it matter whether or not it's an out of court appointment yeah. or an appointment by the by a court I thought yeah. you stamped the filing of the appointment, <laughs> yes. so it was time sensitive. Yes, but that's not necessarily a decision of the court. No, that's true. It's not, it's just I suppose, out of court. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I think it's a vexed question. Now, Jeremy, I wonder if we, I can ask you a question, unless everybody else is going to ask a question. <laughs> I, I'm abusing my position. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you meant, I mean, the, the rule in Gibbs sounds like it's going to be a very important rule. It is a very important rule for. for uh, 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 English contractual uh, debt. Um, you, you mentioned the new model law, which is the 2018 uh, uh, change on insolvency related judgments. Mm. And you didn't think, uh, I think your position was you didn't know when it might come into play. Yeah. Um, is there any particular reason why do you think, uh, you know, politically speaking, I suppose, more of a political question than anything else, but you know, is the rule in Gibbs legally, is it, is it uh, such a bad rule that we shouldn't retain it, or is there specific criticisms about the rule that, that make it unpalatable? It's, uh, well, it's an odd rule. Most practitioners, I think, um, who I associate with a relatively sanguine about the rule because it's a bright line rule. Everyone knows where they stand. However, the course of, in the course of preparing for this talk, if you go online and look at academic articles, I don't think there's one English or English-based academic who likes this rule at all, at all. And I think the main reason is because they see it as um, an impediment to um, complete um, universalism of insolvency law. So the idea should be that a German insolvency judgment should be given effect here and vice versa, an English judgment over there. So um, I think the answer to the question is, I think it's political. Um, uh, and I think also um, we, um, as a uh, jurisdiction, I think it's fair to say are very creditor friendly. And the rule in Gibbs, I would, I would submit tentatively is a creditor friendly rule. Other jurisdictions, oddly enough, many of them in mainland Europe, like Germany and France, are perceived, rightly and wrongly, to be debtor friendly jurisdictions. Uh, I think that's as much as I can say safely. Yes. We uh, have had a question. Um, oh, sorry to interrupt. No, 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 <laughs> this is an interesting one. Thank you very much, whoever this is from. Now, Maybe some, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I got it in. Um, <laughs> Is there any word as to whether the 2019 exit regulations are intended to be permanent? Um, I appreciate that we've retained a snapshot of the EU regulations, but do we think this is intended as a stopgap measure or, or a permanent measure? Well, who would like to have a <laughs> <laughs> my, my feel is that they are, they're intended to be permanent. Um, the, the, the Supreme Court, as I said, has got jurisdiction to, to move beyond uh, EU decisions. If we fall out of step with e EU law in terms of central main interests and establishment, I suspect, and it becomes a problem, Parliament may well step in to legislate for that. Uh, the judges in the Supreme Court also have the option to, to change the law, but I can't see 
other than suddenly jumping back into the EU, I can't see why we would, uh, why those regulations would need to be changed any further. I think that certainly must be right for the transitional arrangements. I don't think Parliament would, inter well, who knows, but it'd be highly unlikely for the UK Parliament to intervene to deprive um, an EU insolvency pre-Brexit of its rights um, after the event. Oh dear, I've run out of time for my question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think one of the uh, criticisms of, of Gibbs is, is that, uh, as Nicola said, and it's just coming your way, um, as Nicola said, that, that, that uh, movable assets uh, will be treated as investing in a foreign trustee, which essentially can take away. Uh, the debtor's ability then to pay the debt because if it's subject to English contract law uh, or English law, uh, then the debt survives the foreign insolvency, uh, and that is not fair, uh, nor is it just. Uh, so, so my question for you, Nicola, and, I, and, and, and I, I generally don't know the answer, is is why is it um, that uh, movable? I mean, you know, a, 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 a debtor may be lucky if they've got movable plus. But why does that rule? Um, what was the reasoning of Miss Justice Snowden to uh, go as far, or was it just purely historical that the uh, uh, immovable property does not that? No, it's a very good question, and I have to admit I wasn't aware of this principle before reading that decision. And it's just the decision um, struck me as counterintuitive because obviously we have a system here where all property vests in the trustee in bankruptcy, and that includes all foreign property. And so to then have a situation where we're prepared to recognize a foreign bankruptcy, but not to allow any property to, immovable property to vest in that trustee in bankruptcy, I found them surprising. And it seems to be based on a, a, an historic distinction to be drawn between movable and immovable, and, and on the simple fact that the bankrupt moves with his property, and therefore wherever the bankrupt's made, bankrupt, it will catch the property he's moved with, um, but not the immovable property, which is in other jurisdictions. Yes. So in English law, the, the provisions of insolvency act provide a very wide definition of property, which includes yeah. immovable and immovable. So the question is, is, is would, would the court order a sale of uh, immovable property? So then the immovable property is transferred from immovable to movable, and then it can be used. And, and my inclination was no, the court wouldn't uh, grant an order for sale because that would be in effect to um, revest the proceeds of sale in the foreign trustee in bankruptcy. And so I think the, re the reality is having found that the um, immovable property does not vest in the foreign trustee, that's where the matter lies. I mean, query whether the foreign trustee can bring separate proceedings in England in order to capture the property. But it, um, I think the important point to take from Bedsamoff is that the um, it doesn't automatically vest. Okay. Uh, as we said, that, that there is a very careful judgment and certainly worth uh, reading. But I think, um, uh, well, I do have more questions, but <laughs> I, I, I think perhaps it's a good time to, to wrap up. And thank you all for attending in person. And for those of you who are watching in the city at home, thank you for attending. <laughs> thank you very much.